Uh, okay, so good afternoon. Okay, so you, so I'm holding you guys up from lunch. So I try to make this uh, short and sweet. So the basic point here is that uh, uh, popular perception in the public at large, and certainly in the media, is that spectacular ideas uh, or that scientific breakthroughs are predicated on spectacular ideas whose brilliance is immediately self-evident when they are first described to you. So for example, something like quantum mechanics or closer home in computer science public key cryptography, which I think uh, Arpita talked to you about on the first day. The moment you show those ideas, they say, oh, this is a work of genius, this is brilliant and stuff like this. And most of you guys will be coming up with such ideas in the rest of your careers. But for the few, the very few who are like me, not very smart, and are therefore worried about your ability to come up with dazzling insights and concepts. The message of this talk is, don't worry. Because it is equally possible to deliver potent results, even with stupid ideas. The key here is not to just have one stupid idea, because then you won't get very far. But to have at least two stupid ideas, and if you are good at it, like me, several stupid ideas, then you might be surprised as to how well they might work in tandem or in conjunction with each other. Okay? And I try to prove this uh, thesis to you with this notion or metaphor of robust query processing in database systems. To give you an intuitive feel of the kind of worldview that we are projecting in this talk, I'll request you to take your mind back to the Commonwealth Games of 2010, which was held in Delhi. Most of you were in uh, school at that time. And you would remember there was a lot of debate about the total expenses of this particular games. Okay? Remember Sulesh Kalmadi, remember Arnab Goswami, Times Now, all this, right? And you found that if you ask the government as to what was the valuation of the total expenses, that was something like 5,000 crores, which you obviously knew, knew was ridiculously low. It won't even pay the first level of bribes. So what does, how, how can this be okay? But then on the other hand, if you ask the hyperventilating media as to what their estimation was, that was around 70,000 crores. Now, this seems preposterously large, of course, at that time. Although now in hindsight, maybe it was actually fairly small because now A Raja has moved it to a different uh, league itself. Okay, it's an art form now. Okay, one lakh eighty-four thousand crores that requires talent. Okay, you cannot do it easily. So now you say that this is preposterously small. This is ridiculously large. What do I do with it? I just take both the numbers and throw them in the garbage and move. But in fact, if you instead took the geometric mean of these two numbers, which is what you see here, then you come up with this number. 18,700 crores, which, believe it or not, is remarkably close to the actual audited value from the controller and auditor general, which was 18,500 crores. Okay. So now what you see is that with two ridiculous numbers, you are able to provide something which is extremely realistic. Okay. So that's the pitch that I'll make through the rest of the talk. And we will do this in the context of database systems. Okay. So we will give you the world's quickest overview of uh, database uh, 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 management systems or DBMS as they are more affectionately known. So as you're already aware from your undergraduate courses, these are large and extremely complex software systems running to millions of lines of code. And they are basically responsible for handling enterprise data through its entire life cycle, starting from capturing the data, generating it, storing it, maintaining the data, and most importantly, asking questions of this information. Okay. And you'll also notice that the database systems uh, community is essentially the cornerstone of the, of the computing industry as a whole. The majority of the computational resources, intellectual resources, and financial resources are all located in database products. We fund the rest of the computer science industry. Okay. Don't tell that to the other speakers who are coming here. but the only reason, for example, computer architecture is alive today is because of database systems, because we have the big money here. 
Okay, so some of you would already have played around with these various kinds of database systems. In the commercial world, you have DB2 from IBM, then there's SQL Server from Microsoft, SQL MX from Hewlett Packard, then from Oracle, there's Exadata, and so on. These are the well known database commercial products. There are also uh, popular public domain database implementations, and many of you would probably have interfaced with either MySQL my, or with PostgreSQL, which are extremely popular for a long period of time. And then there's also Berkeley DB, which came from a university. Okay. So the reason that database systems have become so ubiquitously popular is that they offer you peace of mind. The only reason that you can sleep peacefully at night, for those of you who sleep, of course, okay? hopefully most of you are working on some interesting research idea, but in the event that you are actually sleeping, the only reason you can sleep peacefully is because of database systems. Because why? You remember the acid properties, right? Atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability, and so on, which ensures that changes to any changes you make to the database system are guaranteed to remain there irrespective of any subsequent system failures. Whether there's a volcano, whether there's an earthquake, whether Donald Trump becomes president, doesn't matter. These information will always be immutably put into the database system. So in a sense, you can think of database systems as the Sri Sri Ravi Shankar of the information world, minus the long hair, of course. Okay? We are a little more sober. Than that. The other reason that database systems are extremely popular is they have enormous power in the sense that they support declarative access. And what this means is that you only state what you want, or that is the target, but not the means to achieve it. So the ends are specified, but not the means. This is very different to the normal kind of imperative programming that you are used to, whether it was C, C++, Java, and so on, where given that you wanted to do something, like let's say invert a matrix, you say this is the target, I define these variables, then I go through these various steps, and then I finally come up with the answer. Okay. Database systems are much more powerful, powerful. They just say that, tell me what you want to do, and then I'll figure out a way to do it. This is very similar to the way that we handle our PhD students here. After they gather the courage to come up and ask, say, what should I do? I said, don't ask me. Go write a great thesis, OK? It's up to you to figure it out. Okay? Now, actually, we write the thesis for most of our students here in IISC. But in most other universities in the world, they just let it go and say that it's up to you to do it. OK, so now, essentially, all database systems that you see today belong to a particular flavor called relational database systems, or RDBMS uh, for short. And this is based on the mathematical notion of first order logic augmented with existential and universal quantifiers. And this was invented by Ted Cord of IBM Research. And for this, he got the Turing Award, which again, hopefully you'll remember is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize. And some of you have already been tasked with the job of getting it for India okay, in 1981. And this has led to the well-known uh, 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 statement in the database community that we believe in Cord and not God. So the idea that he had was very similar. So it's actually the whole of relational database systems is very similar to the idea of the Unix operating system, that is to have a few principles and to have composition of those principles. Okay. So here the idea was that all data should be fall, stored in the form of relationals. That's the mathematical notion. For the purpose of this talk, we'll think of it as tables. So a table has rows and columns, and the columns are basically the attributes. There are relationships between the various columns, and there are constraints on the values that can appear in these columns. Okay. So a very simple university database, for example, would have the information that you see here, which is spread across three tables. There's a student table, which has the role number, the name, and the address. And then there's a course table with a course number, what is the title of the course, and how many credits uh, uh, it uh, uh, is offered uh, if you complete this course. And then there's this register table, which tells you which students are registered for which course and what his or her performance was in the course. So on this schematic uh, uh, set of tables, here is the instance of certain rows in the database. So you can see that uh, I am taking the database course. And since I made this slide, I gave myself the highest grade here. Okay? It's an A plus. <laughs> OK, so now given that you have data stored in this form of this very simple set of matrices or tables with rows and columns, how do you interface with it? That's done with the structured query language. And I think most of you would have already survived this uh, 
uh, experience by now, which is called SQL, again invented by IBM's Albert Research Center, responsible for most of the best ideas in the database world for the last uh, 30 years. This was in 70s, and he says, suppose you want to list the names of students in their courses. Most of you would recognize this uh, syntax that you have here, where you say, pull out the names of the students and the course titles from the combination of the information between these three tables, that is student, course, and register. And how do you make sense of the combination? By applying these joint predicates, that is, you combine information between the roll number of the student here and the roll number in the register table. And similarly, the course number from the course table and the course number coming from the register table. Okay. So notice in this formulation, as we mentioned earlier, we specified only the objectives, but not the mechanism to achieve these objectives. So to quantify that, look at the join order. That is, how do you combine the information in these three tables? I hope you recognize the bow tie symbol that we are using here for the equi-join. So one possibility you could have had is to say that I'll combine the student table first with register, which is essentially this join predicate. And then I will join it with the course table, which is the second join predicate. Or maybe for vastu reasons, you might prefer to do this, saying I will join register with course first, that is this second predicate, and then join it with the student table. Does it make a difference whether I go in one, the first option or the second? Do you care whether it makes a difference? Okay. Please remember the join is a commutative and associative operator. And therefore, the result that comes out of either of them is going to be exactly the same. But the running time to achieve this, these joins could be vastly different. To the extent that this may take a few seconds, for this you may have to wait for your grandchildren to be born before the answer comes back to you. Okay? So the output is identical, but the time to produce the output could be orders of magnitude different. Now you might say, OK, I'll figure out the join order. I'll consult the astrologer and fi find out what is the right join order for this query. But even then, notice that this bow tie symbol that you have, which is the join of two tables, is a logical operator. It is not telling you how it should be implemented. It's just saying that combine it by equality on certain columns. Okay? So you would already have seen, hopefully, in your undergrad courses that there is a wide variety of join algorithms available, especially in the 70s and 80s. Everybody and their grandmother were coming up with new join algorithms. So you have nested loops algorithm, which is the simplest. Then you have sort merge, there's hash join, there's semi join, there's index join, and so on. There's a large variety of different join algorithms available. So these are implementations of the logical operator. So you have to decide not only the sequence, but also the specific choice of implementation here. All this is kept hidden from you. You just wrote this stuff here and said, go and do it. Okay? There is a component within the database system called the query optimizer, which will take this declarative specification and then come up with the ideal evaluation strategy. Okay? So th the question is, what does ideal mean? Let us take, assume for the uh, purpose of this talk that it's essentially the efficiency or the response time of the query. That is, how long does it take to execute it? You want the fastest execution of this query. Okay? So the optimality is with regard to the speed. And then the strategy that's used is called the query execution plan. So I'll use the word plan in the remainder of this talk to mean the strategy. This is what is going to be done automatically by the database system without your having to be involved in it. You may not even know that this is happening. You just submit the SQL query, sit back, watch a little bit of ZTV, and then come back and say, ha, oh, the answer has come. Right? That's the thing. Okay. So now if you've never seen this strange animal before called the query execution plan, here is a sample instance related to the query that we saw earlier. It is always a tree of operators which are evaluated in a bottom-up fashion. So here, at the bottom, you find the tables. That is the tables given by the user, which is the student table, the course table, and the register table. And what this tree is telling you is that it says that take the register table, do a table scan, which essentially means look at all the rows in this particular table, then sort it on the join attribute. And then, so this is the, uh, uh, the register.course number with the course.course .course number. Do a merge join on this course number attribute, which is here. And then finally, do a hash join with all the tuples in the, or the rows in the student table. So notice that now this is a physical implementation where you're specifying the sequence of joins. That is, you first join course with register, which is this part. Then you join it with student. 
Second decision that you have made is that this join was a merge join and this join was a hash join and then you came out with the answer. Okay. Now you'd also notice that each of the operators here is annotated with two numbers. One number which is the red number is called as cost which basically tells you how much time does it take to complete this specific operator. Okay. And the other number which you see in green here which is called as cardinality or card for short tells you how many rows are going to be sent from this operator to the next operator downstream. Okay. So just think of it as a series of water pipes. You have taps along the way. The tap tells you how much effort it takes to let the water through. But the volume of water that goes from one tap to the next is determined by the cardinality. Okay. So there is a cost, which is the local cost, and then how much do you throw over the border when you are passing the buck downstream to the operator below you. So for example, this one says that it cost me roughly 7,000 units of time to look through all the rows in the student table, and then I'm going to throw 1,000 rows to the next operator downstream, which is the hash job. So now, how does the database system figure out what is the best way to uh, execute this declarative query? You have given this query here, and this is the black box called the optimizer, which is, as said, hidden just within the engine of the database system. And what it does is that it goes through a complex dynamic programming based exercise in order to come up with the best possible plan. And in our uh, case, we'll assume that this is the fastest plan. So you want the uh, 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 Paul Walker or wind diesel, right? Fast and furious. He'll tell you, okay, given the specification, this is the output. Okay. But there are two inputs to this dynamic program exercise. There are two models. One is called the cost model, which as I said, is essentially the opening of the tap. How much effort does it take you to open the tap in the water uh, system? And this is a function of the underlying hardware. Do you have a 286 machine or do you have a Cray XC40? With some of you, if you haven't seen the Cray supercomputer, please visit the supercomputer center, which is just uh, down the road from here. It's a remarkable machine. It's the Cray XC40. Essentially has a peak performance of one petaflop. Okay. Costs 75 crores of your parents' hard-earned money. So you must go and see it. There's a wonderful picture of the tower building on the, on the top of uh, on, on that machine. Okay. The ones, and you can probably seek an audience with the machine. And once you go there, you'll see how difficult it is to produce these supercomputers in terms of the cabling and the kind of circuitry that is there. So it depends on what kind of hardware is there, okay? whether you have rich parents or not. And also it's a function of the database engine. Okay? Is it that you're using Oracle's highly tuned database engine or are you using something from your seniors where there are lots of infinite loops along the way and so on. Okay? So it's a function of this, but essentially this is predicated on what kinds of software and hardware you have and that tells you the cost of each of these operators in the model. The other issue that you have here is the cardinality as I said, is that how much water do you send from one tap to the next in the pipeline that you have here. This is a function of the data now. Both the distributions within the columns, intra columns, as well as the correlations across columns, either within the same table or across tables. So now what you find in practice, and this is never told to you by the database vendors, is that what you thought was the optimal plan choice may often at runtime, so this was at compile time, you said, okay, I did this dynamic programming and this is the best way to do it, okay? may actually turn out to be highly suboptimal. And we don't mean by saying, oh, it's 20% slower, 30% slower, it runs like Yuvraj Singh or something like that. It's not something like that. It is orders of magnitude worse, 100 times worse, 1,000 times worse. We have examples where it's a million times worse okay? compared to the ideal solution in hindsight. Now, why is it that we are making mistakes? It's because there are errors in the models. So there are errors both in the cost model and in the cardinality model. Typically, what has people's experience has been is that the cost model is fairly reasonable. It's quite decent. It's only a limited impact, maybe 30 to 40% errors. But with the cardinality model, all bets are off. There's a huge impact. Now, there are lots of technical reasons for this which are listed here, which I won't uh, uh, go through now. But if you're interested, we can discuss this offline. But the reality is that you make huge errors in this. If you don't believe me, here is a proof by authority. So what you see here is the picture of the handsome Dr. Guy Lohman, who was the person who built the entire query optimization system for IBM's DB2 system. It's one of the most popular software in the world. And a couple of years back, 
he had this blog post where he said, is query optimization a solved problem? In fact, he had asked this question 25 years prior to that. He's one of the oldest people in the database industry, very well known and regarded. And you can see that he was very unhappy. And in extremely colorful language, he says, the root of all evil, okay, so you can see this is like Donald Trump, right? The root of all evil, the Achilles heel of query optimization is the estimation of the amount of data that you send from one operator to the next, from the scan to the join, or from the join to the group by, and so on. Okay? The Cardinality model can easily introduce errors of many orders of magnitude. Okay? So it's not a small number. Okay? This is all in the A Raja class. Okay? We are doing it with talent. And then he ends with a very cynical note. He says that you might have thought that, okay, typically I'll get very good plans. Occasionally, once in a blue moon, I might get a bad plan. He actually says the completely the opposite. He says that typically you'll get a lousy plan or a lousy strategy, which will be hundreds or thousands of, of times slower than the ideal solution. Only if you go to Tirupati, break a few coconuts, eat a few laddus and so on, and then cross your fingers and your toes, then you may get a good plan. Okay? Very rare. So in database systems, worst case is average case. Okay? Routinely, you get horrible performance. Occasionally, if you're lucky, you may get good performance. That's the message of this story. Okay? Then you might say, OK, well, these guys have been sleeping for the last 30 years. Database guys are useless chaps. They're not doing anything else. Look at all the other fellows, architecture, operating system, and all. They don't have such problems. Well. But I just point you out to a comparable thing in real life, okay? which is a much simpler problem. Predicting election outcomes. Okay? Doesn't have any group buy and having operators and so on. There's no semi-join, right, and so on. Very simple. Whom are you voting for? You just need to get the numbers. But look at the kinds of mistakes that have occurred in recent times, starting from, for example, the Tamil Nadu Assembly elections in 2011, all the polls from the various different organizations were saying that it's a toss-up between the DMK and the AIA, DMK, and so on. In fact, some of them had said the DMK with Karnanidhi is mildly ahead of the other guys and so on. But Jayalalitha had never heard of any of this. She was not watching these polls. She just went and steamrolled the opposition, right? So the final results was not 120 and 110, but 200 odd and 30. Okay. Landslide victory. Okay. None of the polls had predicted this. Then you might say, okay, that is in 2011. Maybe they didn't have the Kaveri water coming into Tamil Nadu. The guys were in difficulty and so on. Look at the assembly elections in Delhi in 2015. Okay, and I think some of you are from there. Again, they said very close to call. It's a toss-up race. Third umpire will have to be called to figure this out. And they again said that maybe there's a marginal early. The BJP will be ahead of the uh, our party and so on. But Kejriwal being a good IIT and was not reading anything, right? He just went and hammered them. Okay, as you can see, it's not just that you won mildly. You have just thrashed the opposition. They can't find the opposition nowadays in the assembly hall. Okay, they kind of invite them. Can you please be the opposition? There's nobody around, right? Becomes boring. 67 and 3. Okay. Again, recently we found that in the UP elections, right? More recently, exactly the same thing happened. They said there will be no single party which will have a, a, a complete majority. Yes. Yogi Adityanath and his uh, cohorts hadn't heard this, okay? They weren't reading this uh, poll result. Same thing happened in the US elections. The same thing happened with Brexit. Okay? And these are much more controllable systems, right? And you get it not just wrong, you get it spectacularly wrong, right? That's the same thing that's happening in databases. So if you don't like us, go and find out why election systems don't work. Okay, okay so now, Actually, there's been a lot of research on this problem for the last four decades in the database community. And there have been different styles of approaching the problem, saying that, how do I get uh, uh, good plans? One is to say that, let me use sophisticated estimation techniques. Because what typically database systems do is to say that, given any column, I would like to come up with some kind of a piecewise distribution of the data uh, the, that is there. And usually, they use some kind of a histogram, which is essentially a summarization. right? They will say that, OK, I don't want to just use histograms. Let me use wavelets instead. Okay, and Some of you would already have been introduced to this, especially if you're doing signal processing. Or you might say that I want to do autonomic or self-tuning histograms, which adapts itself based on feedback to the kinds of data that is there. Or today, everybody loves deep learning, right? You all love deep learning. Right? It doesn't matter what it means. 
<laughs> we say, let's use a deep learning histogram and get this going and so on. And the list that you see here tells you various database conferences, which are the premier conferences in the world, that's SIGMOD, VLDB, and then it's ICD and so on. And the, the number that you see here represents the year in which there was a paper pushing one of these new ideas for addressing the problem. So as you can see, for over the last couple of decades, people have been working on this problem and said, let's use sophisticated mathematical techniques to address this. So this is one approach. The other is to say that I know that I'm going to be making mistakes in this assessment. So let me try to come up with a plan that is good over larger parts of the cardinality space. So even though, let's say, I thought it was going to be 10,000 rows, but it actually turns out to be 100,000 rows at runtime, this plan that was good for 10,000 rows also works well for 100,000 rows. So that's the second approach. And again, you can see there's been a lot of work going on in this uh, area. The last one is to say that, let me first start off by assuming that I'm making the right estimates. I'll start observing the data that I'm seeing. If there's a big discrepancy between what I thought I will get and what I actually got, then I will use this new information, which is now accurate information, to go back to the drawing board and start all over again. Okay. So you thought it was 10,000 rows. It turns out to be a million rows. What do you do? You say, IIO, I made a mistake. Take the million rows now. Now this is the correct information. Go back to the drawing board and say, let me now redesign the strategy here. Because some part of the information that was estimated earlier is now known for sure. Okay. So to make this easy to understand, I'll claim that there is a cricketing analogy to each of these techniques. The first one is the BVS Lakshman style of work, saying that very elegant and so on. We, we all love his late cut, right? Sometimes he cuts so late, even after it's hit the ball, it's hit the wickets, right? But very elegant, very uh, uh, polished and so on. The other approach is to go with the Rahul Dravid approach, saying that irrespective of the wicket, guy is guaranteed to give you some 30, 40 runs. It doesn't matter what it is. He's the wall. We know for sure that even if he's not the very best, he's that is going to be the second best kind of solution, you can depend on it. So this is the second approach. Or the third one is to say that everybody knows that Dhoni is the master of adaptability, right? As the game changes, he adapts himself, changes the run rates, changes the way that you're playing and so on. So he goes from plan A to plan B to plan C based on how the game is progressing. And one of the things that Dhoni was celebrated for was able to think on his feet. Whereas Rahul Dravid usually come in with a set idea and saying, this is what I'm going to do, don't ask me anything else and so on. Whereas in comparison, people like Dhoni were able to dynamically figure out what is the best solution. So these are the three strategies people have. And there are lots of very nice ideas and so on that have come in here. These are all from the very top universities in the world, from the MITs, the Stanfords, the Dukes, and so on. But the difficulty here is that although they're intellectually interesting, all of them lack performance guarantees in the sense that they say, try our techniques but make sure to cross your fingers. And as I said, it's very important to cross your toes as well. Whatever else you can cross, please cross them, because even with this, you have to pray very hard to get a good solution. So why is this long introduction? So because in the course of the last couple of years, our lab here has been able to solve this long-standing three to four decade old problem by coming up with a new query processing technique, which is called as plan bookcase, and you'll see why the rest of the talk. And what this does is to say that the only person who can get these estimations right is Rajnikant. Nobody else can get it right. So we are not Rajnikant, so let's throw away the problem itself. It is the wrong problem is the starting point. Instead, what we will do is that so we'll abandon this estimation process completely, saying it's hopeless. You should not even try it. Instead, we'll come up with a discovery mechanism that at runtime tries to figure out what are the correct values of these cardinalities. That, as I said again, is the amount of data that you're sending from one operator to another operator down this operator tree or the plant tree, which is being evaluated in a bottom-up fashion. So now with this, as I'll show you in the rest of the talk, you can actually come up with worst case performance guarantees in fact, for the one-dimensional case, we can give you a guarantee of four, which basically says that if the ideal solution takes X time, I will guarantee you no matter what the cardinalities are, that I'll finish within four times of you. Essentially, what it says is that humans are 25% of God. God is a little surprised when you say 25%, but this is what you can actually get. Now, you might say four is too bad. I mean, I want close to 90% or 99%. That's what we have with gate scores and all that, right? But remember, 
the typical thing in the industry that you would get is 1,000 times slower, 10,000 times slower, million times slower. So compared to that, four is probably very, very decent. OK, so let's see how this works. So all this uh, 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 notion of plan bouquets uh, comes from the PhD thesis work of Anshuman Dutch, who graduated last year and is now a fat cat at the Microsoft Research uh, Lab in uh, Redmond in the US, okay, and has continued to work on these problems. So the basic idea here is that let's just take a simple manufacturing database, which has the similar tables like you saw earlier in the student database. So you have things like uh, customers who are placing orders for various kinds of parts, these customers come from various nations, and these parts are being supplied by various suppliers and so on. So these are all the tables that you have there. And then let's say you had this SQL query, which hopefully you can parse in real time here. You are saying that give me all the information come from the combination of these three tables, that is the orders part and line item. Line item tells you each order is broken up into several different things that you're ordering. So this is essentially the drill down version of the orders table. And then in order to make sense of this combination, again, we have the join predicates, which is that the, the key of the part should match in the, both the part table and the line item table, similarly for the order and so on. And the last one is saying that the retail price of the part should be less than 1,000. Okay. So even if you have forgotten your SQL, what this says in simple English is, give me all the information about orders for cheap parts. That's all that it's saying. Okay. We all know that it comes from China. but we are asking the database, which doesn't have this prior knowledge, that give me all information about cheap parts. <laughs> so in doing this, the database system will probably come up. Uh, so you'll give this to the uh, relational system. The query optimizer may come up with a plan like this. And in this process, it has to make estimations several times. So the first thing it has to estimate is that how many rows are there in the part table or in the line item table. Usually, this is fairly easy to uh, uh, have a good handle on because this is being maintained by the database catalogs or the metadata which you would already have seen. So this is easy, but subsequently you have to say that how many cheap parts are there in the database? What fraction of them are cheap? Okay. Then you have to do a join which are these two predicates. And as you go up the tree, you'll find that these estimates are typically very wrong. What is worse is that they are multiplicative because as you go up the tree, you keep making mistakes and the mistakes keep adding up. So what you finally get at the end has no bearing with what you started with here. Okay? So it's like uh, feeding in uh, uh, Arijit Khan at one end and getting Lata Mangeshkar on the other side of the system. That is what essentially you have. Okay? Those of you who even know who Lata Mangeshkar is, okay? <laughs> probably that shows my age here. Okay, So this is what can happen. Let's look at the problem framework. Okay? How do we do this? The first thing is that Let's just take this cardinality, which is an absolute number, which tells you the number of rows, and give you a normalized equivalent of it. The normalized equivalent is called a selectivity. It basically tells you how selective this, uh, 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 this particular predicate is. One way of looking at selectivity is, I think, uh, uh, how many people applied for this uh, program? There was about uh, uh, 500. Okay? Out of 500, you 77 were carefully chosen by Ullas and Indu, right? And this is the selectivity is that 77 over 500. So that is very similar to what we are saying here is selectivity is the number of rows that are coming out from this operator as compared to the maximum number of rows that would, could have come out. So in this particular case of the price predicate, which is what are the uh, parts that are cheap, that's less than 1,000 rupees, 20,000 is the number of rows that are coming in here. And at the output, the cardinality is 4,000. Okay? So what this means is that it's 4,000 over 20,000 because in principle, all the 20,000 rows could have been forwarded. But because there's only a few cheap parts, 20% in this case, you'll get 4,000 output compared to the 20,000 input. This ratio is what is called the selectivity. This is 20%. Okay? So once you do this, for each of the predicates that I had earlier here, I can form an independent dimension, which is shown in this three-dimensional picture here. One looks at the selectivity of this filter predicate on the part, which is 0 to 100%. And so this will always be from 0 to 100%. Similarly, you could have for the join predicate. So this is part with line item, which is being joined here. And for the order with line item. So essentially, every query will be a point in this three-dimensional space. So what is our performance metric? So the first 
notation that we have is that let's assume that q sub e is the estimated location of the query in the selectivity space. So this three-dimensional space is called selectivity space. So let's say you say it's 5% of the filter predicate, 2% on this join, 8% on this join. What you'll typically find at runtime to your horror is that you will come up with q actual, which is when you actually run the query and you start looking at the data and find this, is that it has no relationship to what you saw here. You had predicted these numbers. It can be 75%, 62, and 85. That's if you're lucky. Otherwise, it could have been even here. Okay. So next step is that at each of these locations, so this is the red location and the green location, you here had an optimal strategy assuming that the query was located there, which came out from the dynamic programming magic box that you had within the database, very optimized. So P sub OE refers to the optimal plan at the estimated location. Similarly, P sub OA refers to the optimal plan at the actual location. So now what is happening is that you are making a mistake because using the red plan at the green location, okay? because you didn't know in, a, uh, in advance, you thought it was here, only at runtime you find it's here and you're going to be using this strategy at this location. So the sub-optimality that you have in terms of your performance degradation is the cost of the red plan at the green location compared to the cost of the green plan at the green location. The cost of the green plan at the green location is the ideal one. Okay? That's what God would have done but you as a human are going to be using this instead. So this ratio will always be lower bounded, of course, by one, and it can be as large as infinity on the other end, right? Now you can, so this was for a particular pair of combinations, saying that this was estimated actually. If I do this across all possible pairs in the three-dimensional space, then I'll get the maximum suboptimality. Say that what is the worst case situation of estimation and actual, this is what I want to compute over this entire space. Okay, now in order to solve this, because we would like to have a guarantee on this worst case behavior, we'll just make a very simple and mild assumption, which is called as plan cost monotonicity. And all that it says in simple English is that if I pump in more and more data, it is going to take me more and more time to execute the query. Okay? So what does it mean in this three dimensional space? That suppose at this location Q sub two, there was a particular plan which took 100 units of time to complete the query. Then the same plan P for any point in the interior of this cube, with this being the top right hand corner, will be less than 100. Okay? So again, as I said, all that it's saying is that if I go outwards in any of the dimensions, it means I'm pumping in more and more data because the selectivity goes from 0 to 100%. 0% means very few rows. 100% means all the rows. So I'm pumping more data as I go outwards in dimensions. If I pump in more data, it takes more time to process it, of course, right? And therefore, the time taken here will be an upper bound of the time that's taken with the interior of the queue. Okay, so now let's look at how do contemporary database systems behave on just a one dimensional version of this problem, which is just looking at the filter predicate, that is on the cheap parts, P underscore retail price less than 1000. So that is what we show here. Let's assume the other two things are perfect and you have a problem only with figuring out what is the fraction of cheap parts in a database. So what you see in this picture is that on the x-axis, you have the selectivity going from essentially 0% to 100%. That's the range. And on the y-axis, you have the estimated cost of the ideal strategy for each of these selectivities. So if you know that the, the, its selectivity is 0.04%, then the ideal cost is around 24,000. If you know that the selectivity is 60%, the ideal cost is around 380,000 or so. This is what is the best that you could get. Okay? But this best is composed of different plans at different locations. So this is essentially what God would choose. In this range, he would use plan P1, which is the red part that you see here, and that has this structure. So remember I said that every plan is a tree-based structure of operators. At the base, you have the tables called part, line item, and orders, nested loops join, nested loops join. So you're specifying both the sequence and the specific physical implementation of the logical join operator. Once you move beyond 0.16%, God would say that ah, this is no longer the right strategy. Let me change this to be this tree instead. Okay. Now here you're going to do, again, part and line it with nested loops. NL stands for nested loops. And then the join with orders is merge join instead of nested loops. Okay. We can discuss later why these changes are being made, but let's assume right now this is the ideal strategy. Then as you go further here, this is P3. 
this changes the structure again. It's hash join and merge join here. If you go here, it changes again. Now the structure is now essentially a left deep tree, okay, which is here. And finally, if you go to the last one, you'll see that even the join order has changed. Here you did P join L and then join O. Here you're doing L join O first and then join with P. The operator's implementation also different. Here you use nested loops, here you did half joins. But this is the ideal curve that God would have used at each of these locations in the space. So now, if you extend each of these particular plan functions, P1 through P5, this is the curve that you will get. So for example, P1 was the best initially. Then at this point, you have the transition to P2. Why? Because P1 became worse than P2. And then as you can see, it becomes progressively worse and is the worst at the end. Similarly, P2 for the initial selectivities was not so great. It was second best. Then it got into its own. Okay? Started doing better than everybody else. That's why I used P2 as the intermediate segment in the green line that I showed you earlier. But after this point in time, P3 became better, then P4 became better, and finally P5 was the best. So you see the different strategies are ideal at different locations. But if you draw the entire behavior of each of these plants, this is what you see. And what we plotted in the previous a uh, uh, green curve was the infimum of the cost functions that you have here. Okay, so now let's see that this is what is ideal. What happens in the real world? This is what happens with today's database world. And in fact, I, something I forgot to mention, notice that both on the x-axis and the y-axis, this is on a log scale. So selectivity on a log scale, and more importantly, the costs are on a log scale here. So this is what you would ideally like to have this is what you actually get, which is the red line. Okay. How do you get the red line? If you look at, suppose you estimated that very few parts are cheap. And you said that this database is coming from Germany, where everything is expensive by definition, right? There's BMWs and there is Mercedes and so on. Okay. Estimated is only 1%, very few cheap parts. But to your horror, you find that it's actually been hacked by the Chinese and now it's a Chinese database. All parts are cheap. You'll get the fake BMW for a small amount. 99% okay? of them became cheap. In which case, what is going to happen is that you are going to use the red plan, which was very good here, at this location instead. Now. And this is the ratio that you get. So this is the suboptimality of using red at the green location, which was here. So this ratio is 20. You could have the opposite case also. You could have thought this was a Chinese database. It's 80% of them are cheap. That's the estimated location. But then you find out that GST has just come in and it has shot through the roof. Okay, Arun Jaitley says everything is expensive from now on, okay? including good advice. right? So actually it's 0.01%, okay? which means that the suboptimality here is that you are going to use the plan P5, which was ideal at large selectivities, at low selectivities here, instead of using P1. So you use the wrong strategy, and because of this, the ratio that you get here is 100. So what you are actually getting at runtime is 100 times slower than the ideal choice that you should have made in principle. OK, so on that sobering thought, now let's look at, so yeah, that's what is mentioned here. Maximum suboptimality is 100. So basically what we do is we take the ratio of red over green over the entire space, worst cases here, which is 100. So now let's look at how does the plan bouquet system behave instead. All that we do is we say that take that green line that you had before and then make chops along this line. As you see here, each of this is called IC, which is ISO cost. That means there's a fixed cost. So these are horizontal chops that you make along the space. One, two, up to seven here. Each of them is double the previous cost. Why? Because this is on a doubling axis here. Okay. So you say that when your IC1 is 12,000 rupees, think of it if you want to think of it in rupees, 12,000 rupees, 24,000, 48, 96, and so on. Okay. So you just make this horizontal cuts on the existing green line that you have. At each of the cut locations, you will find that there was a particular plan which is considered to be ideal by God. Right? So P1 is ideal here for these first four things, then P2 comes in here, then P3, and then P5. This, oh, sorry. This forms our plan bouquet. P, the plans located at the intersections of the horizontal cuts with the ideal infimum line 
they form the plant bouquet, which is P1, P2, P3, and P5. Notice that P4 has been dropped. Why did why was P4 dropped? Because it was in between two of these horizontal cuts. And remember, each horizontal cut is twice the previous cut. Okay? So this is a doubling algorithm that you have here. Because it's a log scale, they have the equidistance between them. That's all that you do. Second step here. Okay? Now, how do you actually run this uh, algorithm? Let's assume the actual query, which only God and Rajni can't know. Okay? There are only two people in the world who know. That's at 5%. Typical database systems would have tried to estimate it and make horrible errors. We will not try to estimate. Okay? We will start from here and say that I will use this first plan with this cut. This is the budget that I'll give it and say I'll execute plan P1 with the budget of IC1, which is 12,000 rupees. Okay? So think of it that you are taking, for example, that you want to come here and you want to take the gate exam. You would also like to optimize the amount of money you want to pay for the coaching classes or from those whom you want to copy from, right? So say, I only want to pay 12,000 and I want to get a good gate score. Okay? So you try that here. But unfortunately, you don't make it through the gate exam, okay? Because the gate exam is located here. What will you do? One is you can say, I go and open a chai shop and then I'll become a prime minister. So that's one path you can do. Or you might say, hey, maybe I didn't spend enough. I used a cheap coaching class. Now let me go to Fiji instead or Ramayas or something like that. So I will pay now this cost of 24,000 rupees and use this strategy, advanced course. Again, what you'll find is that this will not complete before here because of plan cost monotonicity. Because it said that the cost of executing this is an upper bound on the cost of this here. So this will not be sufficient. So you say, okay, let me throw away the results of this execution. Let me again try this here. This time with 48,000 rupees. Okay. Now your parents are getting anxious. You spend 96,000 rupees, oh my God, still not working. Then you say, okay, I will go to a completely different coach, uh, coaching class. I'll go to Allen's instead. And I think yesterday Sanket told you about all the different coaching classes, right? So we'll go to P2 instead. Okay, I'll go to Kota, sit there for two years. If I'm not dead by it, I'm going to go and scratch the gate exam, right? Budget IC5, 1.9 lakh rupees. And try it, still won't work. Try again. Finally, you'll execute this P3 here which has a budget of 3,80,000 rupees. And this time it will complete because this is to the right of the location here. And again, due to the monotonicity requirement, it's sufficient to complete. So now let's look at the total uh, cost that was incurred by uh, your, uh, okay, and before we do that, so this is the whole algorithm. So now how many of you think that this is a stupid idea? Be brave, okay, you have nothing to lose. Okay? Okay, so you're being too polite, but actually I would claim that these are very stupid ideas. In fact, incredibly stupid ideas, okay? You should get an award for this. Why? You're doing lots and lots of wasted work. First at compile time to produce that green line, so that's a huge amount of work. And then you make it even worse at runtime by repeatedly trying this, this trial and error approach, saying, try this, oh, it didn't work. Okay, throw it away. Start again, try it again, doesn't work. Try it over and over again. Okay? Repeatedly throwing out the work and doing a trial and error approach. Okay? So on the surface, these are two stupid ideas, which by themselves are going to make sure that your performance is awful. But as I'll show you in the remainder of the talk, on the surface, it looks a recipe for disaster but actually work surprisingly well in tandem with each other. So two stupid ideas put together can actually come up with surprisingly potent results. Okay, so let me just quickly go over this. Let's actually compute how badly you did when you tried this trial and error approach. Okay? So you paid 12,000 rupees first, then 24,000, 48,000 and so on. Finally, you paid 340,000 and you made it through the gate exam. That's the sequencing that you had. Total cost that you had, you incurred was 7.1 lakhs. Okay? So what is the suboptimality? God would have spent only the P3 plan cost here. So knows the location is 5%, saying this is go with the Allen and quota, that's the right solution. That's 3.4, but because you took all these trial and error steps, you paid 7.1. So the ratio is 2.1. So compared to the ideal, you have been essentially 50% more expensive. You can do a few obvious optimizations here and bring the 2.1 to 1.8. But you might say, okay, in this particular case, you chose a nice case where it was 2.1 and 1.8 and so on. But how do you know that this will not be a million, for example? Okay. So 
let me first show you what actually happens and then we'll prove why this is the case. We remember this is ideal line. This is what happens in current database systems. If you use a plan bouquet approach, the blue line is what you get. And the blue line, the worst case is only 3.1. So what I showed you in the previous slide was not an isolated instance or an artifact of choosing Q sub A equal to 5%. Irrespective of where you're located here, the worst case is only 3.1 that occurs here. So now let's see why this is true. Remember that all that you are essentially doing is that you are climbing up a staircase in the plan bouquet approach. We first try this, try to get on the first step. First step doesn't work. Go back, go to the second step, third step and so on, right? Essentially all that you are doing is to do a geometric progression and you are adding up the values there. Whereas what does God do? God jumps directly onto the step from there and says, oh, I know that this is here, right? So you are located somewhere here. You are painfully climbing up the steps and the other person knows the location of the step. Now you want to com compare the cost of your painfully climb up the staircase compared to directly jumping onto that. Okay. So let me just show that to you in this slide, it becomes easy. So you paid the cost of the first ISO cost cut, 12,000 rupees, then you paid 24,000 and so on, all the way till you exceeded the location of the object that you had okay, on the staircase. So this is just a simple summation of your geometric progression, correct? From your high school arithmetic, this is what you would get. What would God pay? God would could potentially have paid this, but for the sake of argument, we'll assume that at least God would pay this because it's between two of the cuts. The minimum that God would have paid would have been this last but one term. You might just have been a little before that and then jumped like this and said, oh my God, I saw this here. I have to come back and get this here. Okay? So this is God, only this element, and you are paying the summation. Okay? Now, if you take the ratio of these two, which is the worst case uh, suboptimality that you have, you can show that it's upper bounded by the geometric progression ratio. Okay? So A here is the initial cost and R is the common ratio that you have in jumping through the steps. So it's R squared over R minus 1. And with a simple math, you can show that this is minimized when R is equal to 2. And therefore, you will get the worst case of optimality would be 2 squared over 2 minus 1, which is 4. So this tells you that irrespective of what the query was, no matter how the weather was, no matter whether you prayed or not, compared to the ideal, you will always finish within four times of it. So now you may say, okay, this is only good enough for IISC and our colleges will do much better. We want to get 2.5 or 3. 4 is too bad. Okay? I would just suggest that don't waste your time on trying that because you can also prove that this is the very best performance that can be achieved by any deterministic online algorithm, not just plan bouquet. Okay? If you take this entire class of deterministic algorithms, you cannot do better than 4. But of course, then there are randomized algorithms and so on, which some of you may have seen. There are some better approaches there. But in the deterministic world, you cannot do better than this. Okay? How does this work in practice? So I'll wind up with this. You might say that, okay, that was just in theory. Does it work in the real systems? This is the performance on Postgres SQL. X-axis are different database benchmark queries run on the Postgres system. So don't worry about what these say. They're basically well-known benchmark queries that everybody in the community agrees are reasonable queries. Y-axis is the worst case of optimality that you had. And again, it's on a log scale. So with the Postgres optimizer, you get all these skyscrapers, which are the red lines here. So for example, this tells you that the specific plan chosen by the Postgres database query optimizer was 1 million times, because there's 10 power 6, 1 million times slower than the ideal solution in hindsight. Okay? And then there are several which are in the 1,000 and 100 category and so on. Okay? Whereas if you look at the plan bouquet approach, is the green approach here, then you find that, of course, it is worse, but then it's bounded above, and it's typically of the order of maybe around 10 to 20 or so. Okay? So compared to a million, this is far better. And in practice, in fact, you find that the values are even lower than this. Okay, so basically the message of this talk was that with this plan bouquet approach for the very first time, in spite of having two core stupid ideas, you can get actual performance guarantees compared to the ideal. Whereas earlier, as I said, you had to pray very hard and even then usually you weren't lucky, but here you were actually able to make sure that you can mathematically prove that this is the uh, guaranteed uh, quality of the solution. Okay? 
And then there are a lot of other reasons why it's very attractive to database vendors. In fact, some of them have already picked up this idea, but we won't go into that. If you want to find out more details about this particular project, then this is available off our website. The overall project is called as uh, Quest. There's a concepts paper which gives you why Plan Bouquet is a different approach to the whole problem that people have been struggling for for uh, the last uh, 40 years. So think of it like reverse sweep, right? Last 200 years, everybody was sweeping in one direction. Sunil Gavaskar would say, tilt the bat at 35 degrees to the horizontal and then do it. Ideally, India should have discovered the reverse sweep, right? Because we do jadu left and right. We never discovered it. We said, oh, somebody else from outside will do it. But once you discover the reverse sweep uh, in cricket, suddenly you found a new uh, way of, of approaching the problem. So the same thing here is that we said the original problem is wrong. It's not that the solution is wrong. The question you're asking is wrong. Okay? So it's like big data. All big data questions give you wrong answers. Right? So, so you will find the basic concepts here. There's also a prototype system which you can also go in our lab and see if you like, which got the best demonstration award in the entire world in the VLDB conference. And then there is an ACM transactions on database systems paper, which gives you in gory detail as to how this whole system works. It talks also about randomized algorithms and other stuff like that. Okay, so what is the basic takeaway here? The world view was that we have an SQL declarative query where it says go and do this magically and do it well. And you would like to come up with the optimal strategy to achieve this target. But unfortunately, you had this uh, horrible dragon in the middle which was coming in and said that, do you know the correct selectivity? So the cardinalities, which is the amount of data that flows from one operator to the next, or one vertex to the next in this tree that you have for the execution. So what we have said is that, let's use the Gandhi-Giri approach. Take this plan bouquet full of flowers to the dragon. It will roll over and I say, please tickle me. Okay. Now you can get near optimal performance with this guarantee. Okay? Yeah. So with that, I'll uh, end my talk and uh, hopefully you'll have some ideas to why even sometimes stupidity can help if you use it in the right proportions and the right combinations. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank you.